I'd like to thank Charlie and the other administrators of the College of Complexes for allowing me to speak tonight. I'd like to thank the student body of the college who are here to hear me tonight. Um, a little closer? How's this? Is that better? Well, no. Should I? You have to speak from the diaphragm, man. <laughs> Just belt it out, you know? Okay, can you hear me now? Yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah. Is that better? Yeah. Okay, all right. Wrigley Field, next stop. All right. <laughs> okay. I'd like to begin by making a few statements on the subject matter. And what these statements say will be used as the basis for everything that I surmise here. Now, the first statement that I'd like to make is that 90% of the pains and difficulties experienced by blacks are a direct result of the misuse of their own minds and their own faulty thinking. Now, this just does not apply to blacks, it applies to everybody, okay? Now, uh, I'd like to also say that because of these very extreme circumstances that are within the minds of blacks, they create the situations and the behaviors that are prevalent in the news articles that we're all used to seeing and hearing on almost a daily basis. Now, if you have read a portion of the paper that I distributed, then um, I can tell you that this can be approached on two levels to understand why blacks commit acts of violence against each other. Now we can go into statistical evidence which is which I which I brought here. This is the red eye. Every month they do a statistical analysis of violence in the city of Chicago on a monthly basis. And in particular the murder rate, and without fail, 80 to 90 percent of the murders in this city are committed by blacks against blacks. Blacks are 32.9 percent of the population of this city, but they commit the vast majority of murders. So obviously something is going on within that specific demographic group that is somehow an anomaly. And I have wanted for years to try to figure out why this was so. And as a person who has relied upon his intellect mainly to solve problems, I was frustrated by the fact that my intellect could not answer that question. And I realized through reading various esoteric literatures that the intellect could not solve problems related to human happiness. The intellect, the function of the intellect is to propose all sorts of questions which are beyond itself, which forces the mind to higher fields of consciousness where the answers to human happiness lie. Now, the intellect is useful for reminding us of how to greet someone in the morning, or to how long to bake a cake, or how to design a building, or what time to catch the train in the morning. But the intellect 
which is comprised of memorized data, cannot make us whole. It is worthless in terms of applications to problems regarding human happiness. And if we're talking about people killing people, we're talking about unhappy people. So we can't use our intellect to solve this problem. Like I said a few minutes ago, the intellect is useful for those items where we need to solve a level, a problem on the level of, of earthly things, of uh, material matters. But human happiness, it can't help us with. So I explored, as independent study, areas regarding the human mind that apply to solutions of problems on the esoteric level. Now, the esoteric level is that space above the human intellect where we can reliably apply higher principles to solve human level problems. Now, the, the, the basic problem with people who would resort to violence has to do with a separation from their true or original nature. And if we think about it, the conditioned mind that would think that it can solve a problem or achieve personal justice through violence is something that's learned behavior. It is not a part of our innate and natural self. This is something that is passed on from talkative people who are mixed up but don't realize they're mixed up. And so we take these assumptions given to us by unconscious human beings and apply them to our own lives. And this is basically what, <coughs> what the average African American has done. Because throughout the history of African Americans, violence has been used <laughs> by them and against them. And so it's an acquired or learned behavior to impulsively use violence as a means of solving a problem. So I had to do some personal research and basically I had to research my own mind to see how often in my own past I had used violence. And I have never used it on the level of killing anyone, but I have thought that violence in some ways had a particular appeal in which it would solve a problem. But once I began to read spiritual literature and become more aware that there are higher alternatives, I dismissed any notion that violence had a place in this world for any reason. So I've applied principles of esoteric wisdom to the level of activities of blacks, especially um, blacks who find gang culture or the, who are involved in the criminal class or prison mentality and try to understand them from that level. Because a lot of people don't realize it, but the gang culture is deeply embedded in the fabric of the black community, in large swaths of the black community, swathes or swaths of the black community, Gang culture is endemic. Uh, it, 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 it's, very, um, it, it, it's very severely inculcated in their way of life and in their everyday activities and uh, uh, ways that uh, a lot of people can't imagine. 
So um, I've, I've thought about it, and I've, I've written uh, papers, and I've had discussions with individuals to try to see how severely this this pro how severe this problem is, and uh, it, it's 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 very um, it, it's it's very a, a, it's an acculturated um, concept that um, many people are not deeply aware of. So what I, what I want to do is just um, go over a few steps of. Um, ideas on the principles of um, not of, of not using intellectualized or conditioned thinking uh, to solve this problem. I really don't want to go into solutions for the problem. Maybe we can reserve that for a future date. But this subject is so vast till I'd like to concentrate this session on just trying to make people aware of what the actual problems are in terms of violence in the community. Now, now I've looked on the internet for, and it, the internet you're supposed to be able to find solutions to and anything in the world, anything you, that you can think of, you can find on the internet. But I've looked up uh, the question of why blacks kill each other, why they commit acts of violence, and I've never found anyone who, or any um, site that's able to accurately provide the answers to those questions. The answer lies in as far as the as far as the intellectual answers go, it's based on the historic the historical evidence of blacks being in an environment and in a an institution where violence is prevalent, and they see this and they have imitated it as coerced behavior, uh, coerced, coerced and learned behavior that, well, if violence works to solve this person's problem, it can solve my problem. So it becomes learned behavior as imitative uh, uh, actions. So on the intellectual level, it's the exposure of blacks to violence and uh, learning it and using it in ways in which it, it can it can solve, supposedly solve their problems. So uh, on the um, esoteric level, it has a lot to do with how the mind is conditioned away from naturalness, which has nothing to do with violence. So if a person surrenders his human dignity and his humanity to another, he automatically hates himself. Now, I don't know if you can, if you can sense this yourself, but if you can, then you'll understand that anybody who allows himself to be placed in an inferior position of subjugation, automatically, they don't like themselves too much after that fact. Because at that point, they have surrendered everything that makes us valuable as human beings, that makes our humanity worthwhile and distinguishes us from, from any sense of, uh, of, of our humanity, of, our, of, of uh, what makes us the noblest and highest creations in the universe. So, from that standpoint, it's, it's something that's deeply embedded in us to resist any effort to be dominated by another human being. Uh, it's, it's just a natural reaction. Uh, we don't want to lose our, our, 
connection with our humanity in any way. Now, what happens is from that point on, there's a sort of a self, a self hatred, a self loathing, and a self condemnation that takes place at you that point. And Are you okay? the unique circumstances of African Americans is that there's also a physical element that makes us dislike ourselves because so many times we have been using our physical self to define who we are. That's not who we are. Our physical self is just a vehicle for living here on this planet. It has nothing to do with who we are. You cannot develop an inner identity based upon something as superficial as your physical appearance. What that means is that your happiness has absolutely nothing to do with your physical construction. It has nothing to do with how you look. Also, your physical appearance is just the shell of who you are. You have a spiritual being that is more important than any physical aspect of you. Basically, humans are humans have four major attributes: the physical self, the intellectual self, the emotional self, and the spiritual self. And for us to to emphasize either one of those over, over the other. Uh, leaves us uh, dissatisfied or leaves us unsatisfied to um, in, in all other areas. So if we emphasize our physical existence over our spiritual being, it will create a sense of unhappiness because that's where your happiness is. It's in your spiritual being. It's not in anything outside of you. Uh, most people are most people are they they fail to understand that your sense of self identity comes from only one place and that's your spiritual being everything else your money your possessions your physical self have absolutely nothing to do with happiness it takes a person with a spiritually attuned mind to understand the, the deep importance of that particular idea. So that's where I am in terms of finding a answer to why it is that blacks murder other blacks. I mean, there has to be something unique about the mind of African Americans if the statistics, if it's such a statistical anomaly that blacks are murdering each other at such a high rate. I mean, if you, if you were to take blacks out of the city of Chicago, you could reduce the criminal justice system by 80 to 90 percent. That that that's that's amazing. That's mind-boggling. So uh, we have to understand uh, that this is a problem specific to a a very a very unique group of individuals, and we have to apply unique solutions to the problem. But like I said, I'm not really interested in solutions today, or, or I'm not interested in talking about solutions. I'm just interested in having everyone understand what the basic problem is. And the problem lies in self-hatred. Self-hatred is the, is the cause of the problem. Now, most intellectuals and politicians, they will want to 
address effects rather than the cause. They'll want to say, well, it's because they lack education. Well, it's because they don't have jobs. Well, it's because they didn't get an apology for their ancestors being enslaved, or whatever. That's like saying that the illness causes a sickness. You can't look at an effect, you need to go to the cause. A competent doctor, he doesn't, he doesn't prescribe medication for a sore toe if you go in and complain of a headache. In order to solve the problem, you need to look at the cause of the problem. So if we look at causes, and there's one cause and one cause only, there are not a thousand causes for the violence. But politicians will have you think that it has something to do with a lack of, of, of money, because that's what politicians do. They, they like to spend money. So they'll try to throw money at a problem. And money has nothing to do with it. You cannot, you cannot use money to fix a problem. You're looking, you, you're looking for a, you, you can't look for an outer solution to an inner problem. And that's what you're doing if you think that anything outside of a, a new mind can solve this problem. Any change that doesn't involve a change in human nature is really no change at all. So you want to change people's very nature. And there are ways of doing that without supplying people with an inexhaustible stream of unearned benefits or trying to cajole people in some way to do better. You have to have people unlearn their conditioned behavior. I have an article, I've got an article here from Tuesday's New York Times in the op-ed section where they talk about unlearning gun violence. But, but they don't really teach you, they don't really express the proper techniques for having people unlearn conditioned behavior. So they really don't get at the heart of the problem, which means that they can't solve the problem. They think that they can go out and have these people called interrupters go into the community and stem a problem that's about to arise or keep someone for exact, from exacting revenge for a recent shooting. That approach is ineffective and it's not, um, it's not the best approach for having someone shed values, inner values that need to be extinguished. Um, esoteric wisdom is a technique that can do that, but you need principles, you need principal minds to, to teach those, and there are very few teachers available. So um, you have to, happiness isn't, it's not, happiness isn't the acquisition of anything, it's not any activity, it is not an association with another human being. Happiness is a ridding process. It's ridding yourself of everything that makes you unhappy. So you have, you have to go in the opposite direction that most conditioned minds think you should go in to find happiness. So it's a ridding process. And uh, it's inner freedom. And you might say freedom from what? and it's freedom from everything that makes you unhappy. And it's, uh, it's, 
It could be freedom from fear of being ignored or unwanted, or it could be freedom from muddled thinking that drives us to impulsive actions and later to regrets. It could be freedom from secret anxieties and angers that we tell no one about. These are all psychological fears, you know, um, that keep people unbalanced and um, in a state of disillusionment to the point where they would take a gun and go and murder somebody. So we're talking about inner fears here. We're not talking about external fears. We're not talking about um, being chased by a tiger or crossing a busy street. Those are external fears. And those are fears that are necessary for our survival. They, they ensure our survival. So those are the fears that are, I wouldn't say healthy, but if you need to run out of a burning building, you do that. But I'm talking about the psychological fears that people have that drive them to do things. Uh, people who have, um, uh, psych uh, who have a, uh, who the, whose sense of psychological survival is threatened in one way or another, not their physical uh, existence. So that's what motivates a lot of people to do the things that they do. It's their sense of psychological survival, you know, because our physical needs are easily met, you know. If you need uh, food, shelter, clothing, um, which are our basic needs, those are easily met. It's the psychological fears and needs that people have that drive us to the insane things that we do. And um, basically the insane things that people do who kill other people. So it, these are unprincipled minds. Uh, people, principled, two, two principled people could live in a cardboard box together on the sidewalk. Two unprincipled people, they can't share a continent together. They would seek each other out and kill each other. So it's a matter of principles. And if a person has no principles, then he is capable of anything. So the thing you want to do is you want to supply people with principles, but you can't let them know their principles because they would automatically resist them if you gave them to uh, if you gave principles to them directly. Uh, so you don't. So that that's why uh, techniques such as parables are used uh, to try to change people's. Uh, behavior and to uh, renew their minds. Uh, parables are good techniques because they, they, they don't directly tell you about it. They're more like uh, psychological pictures that are given to you of everyday subjects, but that have a, they, they have a sense of, of permanency and they can't easily be corrupted by the person who takes those images into their mind. Parables are used to bypass, bypass your conditioned thinking so that they penetrate directly to your intuitive mind, which knows the truth, recognizes the truth, and welcomes the truth. Because your conditioned mind doesn't want the truth. It's, it's, it's quite satisfied living lies. So parables are good techniques for having people in, uh, embed uh, truthful ideas that alter and um, uplift one in ways that just intellectual uh, thoughts and intellectual uh, words don't. So um, that's what um, esotericism can do. But it's, it's, it's trickier than that in terms of trying to, in terms of trying to change the minds of people who would see value in killing another human being for the most minor of reasons. It, it's mind-boggling to think of how senseless these acts of violence are in the community. But it's imperative that we get a handle on finding solutions. And that's what has motivated me to do the work that I've done over the past 10 years 
and trying to understand the true reason, reason, well, reason why there's so much violence in the black community. Um, I've, I've worked singularly and um, I've worked without the benefit of of any other resources other than the books and my own mind because there had to be a lot of self-examination that went into my discoveries because in a lot of ways you, you can't really discuss this with other people because a lot of what I say is would be cringeworthy to a lot of individuals and so um, this has to be uh, work that's done uh, in solitude and without the benefit of other people's um, ideas or opinions which would obscure the facts. So um, my um, search is still ongoing, but um, I'd like to try to develop what I'm doing into a book at some point. And um, because you could you could fill volumes with um, with the causal reasons for the violence in the community, I don't know if anyone who is um, in the political world or in the philanthropic um, areas would used would use my information um, to uh, to try to bring about change uh, from the vantage point and the resources that they have available, but essentially it doesn't have anything to do with spending lots of money. It has more to do with gathering people in a place where we can allow them to, to see that they're not acting from their true nature but from an invented self and it's, it's artificial and it has no, no, no basis in reality. Everything that they do is, 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 is a distortion of reality. I, you know, I hear all the time, I hear people say, keeping it real. You know, a house cat is more real than the average person who would say that. Because a house cat has not been fixed with the neurotic notion that he needs to be a tiger or a lion. He's quite satisfied being what nature has asked him to be, a cat. But you have other individuals who think that they, who have this ideation of being gangsters or uh, drug dealers or or pimps, or some other antisocial figure that they are so out of touch with reality. It's it's, it's just uh, it's like I say, it's mind-boggling. They they don't know how to be man. They've never they've never had a male role model who is anywhere near the the proper. Aspect who demonstrates the proper aspects of what a man should be. So they're confused individuals who confuse others. So there's, there's a lot of work to be done, but it can't be done with intellectual thought. It has to come from someone who has engaged in a significant amount of self-examination. Um, just to quote Socrates, the unexamined life is not worth living. And I would, I, I, I would, I say that from experience, my own personal experience. And for, for me to uh, have lived a major portion of my life in a state of not knowing and acting from the artificial idea of who I am has caused me tremendous pain and suffering. And um, it's not apparent outwardly all the time, but inwardly I felt that pain on a continuous and daily basis. 
and that's why I took the initiative to try to escape from that painful state and in doing so I discovered many things about others who were in that same painful state that I was in and trying to flee from. So I have worked diligently on myself uh, through intense self-reflection and application of higher principles in order to become a better person and a freer person inwardly because that's where all freedom is. You can have political freedom, you can have financial freedom, you can have physical freedom and still be a slave to a thousand and one things. And I found that out. And so I choose to develop the inner man and not worry about what's going on outside of me. Because, because what's outside of me has no effect on me. It's not the outer event that makes you unhappy. It's your inner reaction that causes all your pain. You know, um, I read Buddha about uh, 10 years ago. I read um, the Four Noble Truths by Buddha. Um, suffering exists. Suffering has a cause. This cause can be ended. There is a way to accomplish this ending. It took me 10 years to figure out what he was talking about and what he meant. Buddha. Yeah, the Four Noble Truths. It took me 10 years to figure out what he meant by that. But when he did, it lifted, when I did finally figure out what he meant, it lifted a great burden off my shoulders. So it, it let me know that all suffering comes from within. There's no such thing as suffering outside of you anywhere. It's, it's your reaction to things that causes all your suffering. It's not the things themselves. So we must attend to the way that we act the way that we react to something, not to that thing itself. So um, I'm not going to go too much, go further over my time limit. I'd like to keep it uh, simple if I can. But basically, uh, it's a problem with the inner mind that people possess that cause them to do what they do and nothing else. But let politicians tell you something else. Let social workers tell you something else. Let, um, let others who would seek an outer solution to an inner problem, who would falsely seek an outer solution to an inner problem, tell you something different. But I know the truth, and I'm going to work with anyone who understands what I know to be true. Will you change that? No. And now, our speaker is open to your questions. And I see Gene Harker has his hand up, and Margaret, and Kareen, and Ben, and we'll stop there for now. Anyway, Gene. Uh, do you feel, from your research and your thought, uh, that the war on drugs has anything to do with uh, this violence. Does the war? Well, I think I think drugs. I think that the proliferation of drugs has something to do with the violence. I don't know if the war on drugs itself would have any thing to do with the violence. I, I I'm not that familiar with uh, with uh, that to go into any detail or to or to answer it uh, in any way that uh, might, uh, might help you. Thank you. No problem. Uh, Margaret? Um, what, uh, I was a little bit confused about how you were using the term esoteric. Could you define how you were using it and in, in what you've written and what you talked about? Yeah, um, esotericism is a science that it's, it allows people to, um, it's, it's a practical approach to a, 
personal experience in which we are healthy and happy human beings. What it does is it, does, it, it's, it mainly consists of dissolving the artificial, the false self that we all live from. All of us live from a false self. Uh, it could be a self that, um, it could be a self based on your physical construction. That's your artificial self. It, the artificial self is the source of all the individual and mass insanity in the world today. The artificial self. So uh, esotericism is a science that allows us to dissolve this artificial self. Now, the artificial self, uh, in, in psychology, they call it the ego. It, they call it the ego. In, uh, in philosophy, they call it the lower nature. Um, in, um, in, um, in religion, they call it the sinful self. Myst mystics call it the false self. But it's the self that causes all of our problems. It's everything that's bad within us. Whereas the true self is everything that's good and positive in us. Is, is there somebody else who that, that you're following that school of thought that you read about that particular use of the word from them, or this is something that you've devised? No, I haven't devised this. Uh, this. There are a lot of people throughout history, a lot of uh, sages, spiritual people who use this. I particularly uh, read the, the works of Vernon Howard. I don't know if anybody here is familiar with Vernon Howard. No. Uh, he teaches about mysticism, and uh, people such as um, uh, Albert Einstein. He was a mystic. You know? Ah, come he, on. Albert Einstein. He said that yeah, yeah. the most beautiful and the most profound e emotion that we can experience is the sensation of the mystical. So he understood mysticism. Um, there was. Um, <laughs> Browning, uh, William Blake, um, Soren Kierkegaard, um, Rene Descartes, Augustine, Baruch Spinoza, Immanuel Kant, giant among mystic philosophers. Uh, there were many of them. Uh, all right, uh, Karina Shushan. Um, have you explored um, whether this is a problem with African American women? I work in corporations and have worked alongside and have many uh, African American female colleagues who have been rather successful at large corporations and have good careers in college educations. Well, <laughs> women in general don't tend to be, be as aggressive as men. And um, the fact that they have degrees and are in the intellectual pursuits uh, would mean that they don't need to um, they don't need to compete for um, for um, scarce resources on the level that uh, guys in gangs would who don't have who don't have college degrees or don't see value in going to school. Um, that whole group of individuals typically who commit these crimes don't have the same value system as the women that you speak of. So it's on a different level. Now, uh, for instance, uh, they don't value reading, knowledge, or education. I go to the Printer's Row Lit Fest every year. I could swing a dead cat and not hit three blacks at that event at any given time. Now, I don't know if you've ever been there. Charlie, have I ever been there? Oh, yeah. Okay, okay. okay. That, that answers my question. That, that answers my question. You know, um, I, I would probably, if, if, if I were a different uh, persuasion, I would be considered a racist for saying that. But it's just an observation. It's just a fact. And um, if if it were if, if they valued reading or education or knowledge, they would there would be a lot more blacks there than there are at any particular time. But the situation 
is different for African Americans than it is for African American women versus African American men. The African American women have made they right. make strides. Yes, in yes. academia, and careers. In but, okay, now you're seeing a microcosm of African American women. You're not seeing a whole uh, flood of them coming into the institutions that you speak of, such as the colleges or in the uh, corporate world. Uh, I go, you know, every, every night I go over to Cook County Jail, and I go over there in order to explore those individuals who find value in going to jail. And I, I talk to them. And um, if you were to take some time out to go over there, you would see that the people who value violence, they don't think like the people that you may be exposed to in your own career field. So there's a different mentality. And it's not the majority. It, you, like I say, you're looking at a, a microcosm of people. It, it, you know, it's nice to. It, it would be nice to think that there's this there's this great flood of African American women who are doing such great things as Melody Hobson. You know, I don't know if you're familiar with her, if you've ever heard of her, but she's she's unique and she's almost unique in her uh, in her position. You know. Um, of having achieved certain uh, worldly heights. I don't know how her inner self is, but her intellectual level is is commendable. But it but that still has nothing to do with her inner self. She may be in inner turmoil, you know, for some reason that Dan Weinberg. she can't understand. Excuse me, uh, go ahead. I'm sorry. Uh, Dan okay. you, you say you said uh, <clears throat> interrupters are ineffective because they they sh they shed inter inner values, and you say you go to Cook County Jail often mm -hmm. to talk to people. Yeah. So not to change minds. Not to change minds. No. Right. Because I can't change their mind. Only the truth can do that. So your investigation, you're, you're re doing research at Cook County Sure, Jail. sure. Okay. Um, you say you don't want to talk about solutions tonight. Right? No, I don't. No. no. Well, I, I can tell you one thing, though. The yeah. solution would be un to it's unlearn great. everything that they've learned from the point, from the moment they were born. It's how are they gonna, all right, how are they going to do that? Is it, is it, is it up to society to, for people like you and me and her and her to go to Cook County Jail every, you know, once a week or twice a week or four times, five times a week and talk to people? I mean, how how are these people going to unlearn what they've learned from slavery, from discrimination, from living in a rotten place, whatever, whatever reason? I mean, why do you even go there? I mean, do you really think you're changing the world or do you think... I'm not trying to change the world. Do you think you're really world. investigating or is this... Is this this a worldly thing like Buddha? He goes sits on a mountain and he sort of investigates. He goes to Cook County Jail once a week, and or five times a week, and then he goes and sits on the mountain for ten years. I mean, is that what is the purpose? Well, actually, well, first you have to understand, sitting on the mountain is a metaphor for achieving higher consciousness. No one is physically sitting on a mountain. Okay, oh. the mountain represents your higher consciousness. Okay. Okay. So I, I I could be on ground on ground floor. Okay. And, <laughs> and still be on the mountain. Yeah, yeah. Because the mountain that's all it is. It's, it's a metaphor, just like uh, the Garden of Eden, or uh, the Promised Land, or the, you know the, uh, Mount Ararat. Those are all metaphors for higher consciousness. Oh. You know, th there's no physical. Um, okay. But but uh, did I ask you a question? Uh, no. Okay, I so want to I want to answer your question. So, yeah, okay. uh, so uh, you're saying how 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 this is feedback? You're saying how can me going over to the county jail um, help anyone? Right. Like I said, I'm not trying to help anyone. I'm trying to investigate 
the dishonest minds that see value in going to jail and to find out what provokes a person to do what they do. Now, you know what I do? I ride with uh, cab drivers who take people from the county jail and I've ridden with hundreds of people who have left the county jail, uh, who were discharged from the county jail. About, about 30% to 40% of the people who jump out of the car after they got into their destination are black. You know what percentage of the whites or Hispanics have jumped out of the vehicle? No. Less than 1%. Less than 1% of the Hispanics or blacks that were taken away from the county jail jumped out of the vehicles and ran rather than paid a fare. Oh. <clears throat> but you got at least 30 to 40% of the blacks jump out of the vehicle and run. Well, that's a I'm not a cab driver, I'm okay. Neil. Uh, yes. Yes, sir. How do you want my behavior to change? <laughs> How do I want your behavior to change? How is your behavior now? Yeah, <laughs> There's a lot of it. There's, there's a lot of it. A lot of bad behavior? I didn't say bad, I said a lot of behavior. Well, I mean, what, what, you know, do you have ideas about what I, what I might do, or I might do differently, or well, what if, difference if, I might if make? You have, if you have some, some behavior such as a bad habit that you're now uh, enslaved to, see the pain of that behavior. See the pain and the suffering that is causing you and possibly other individuals other individuals. You have to see it consciously. What, what does that have to do with the young black men down the block? What does it have to do with them? It has a lot to do with them. If they are consciously aware of the pain of their behavior, then they'll want to change it. But they're not conscious. They're not conscious human beings. How are you doing? Oh, continue, please. So, so you've got no connection between me and them? Sure I do. Anyone who doesn't have a spiritually attuned mind is not happy. Do you have to the question is, do you have a spiritually attuned mind? I do. If Neil wants to change. Jesus Christ could walk the foot off the ground without the lots more area than half the people would pay no attention. Okay. All right. Uh, LP Anderson. Yes, sir. In your research, have you come up with any research that indicates that black babies and white babies born together in the same hospital, why do black babies go on to become gangbangers and white babies don't? Are they, <laughs> are they different at birth? That's what I want to know. Do you think there is no difference different? between human beings at birth. They have a clean slate, okay? It's conditioned behavior. There, there is no innate characteristic that would say one would be one thing and one another. It's conditioned and learned behavior. That is the, the conditioned mind. We're influenced and shaped at birth in ways that separate us from reality and take us away from our true identity. So, like I said, People are victims of, of talkative but mixed up people who don't know they're mixed up. So that baby, that black child is going to an environment where other people are involved in self-damaging activities. I don't know, maybe the white child is too, but there's a, a, a high likelihood that that black child is. So. That's where we should focus our, our efforts in terms of trying to understand the problem. That was my question. Does it have something to do with the environment of child? It's, it's environmental. It's, it's environment, yes. And we should be addressing that, right? The environment? You, you can't change. You can change the environment, but you can still have the mindset 
you know, uh, the environment. Yeah, we want to change the environment, but uh, you have to change everybody's mind in that environment, or else you're going to have uh, individuals who are corrupted, who are already corrupted in that corrupted environment. You know, you, you could you could set these people down in paradise, and you know, the Garden of Eden, and and they would soon level that paradise to the they would bring it down to the level of their own frenzied minds. You know, they would take paradise and destroy it. It's already been done. Okay, uh, Tim Bolger. Do you see a strong correlation between the behavior of, of the black race and a correlation between most of them being White Sox fans? <laughs> this is coming from a Cub fan? Yes. <laughs> I'm just going to laugh at that. I like the fact that you're bringing levity to a serious subject. <laughs> okay, Ileana, do you have a question? Okay. Yeah. Can, can you tell about yourself, where you was born, where you cut on, because it seems like you can be good I'm, I'm from Chicago, born right here. All that way. <laughs> yeah. Um, Southside? Excuse me? Southside? Uh, yes, I'm a Southsider originally, born at Cook County Hospital. Uh, went to high school in Southside uh, for my first year at Wendell Phillips. That was an all-black high school, but I didn't think I could get uh, education that would prepare me from co for college there. So I transferred in my sophomore year to Sin High School on the north side. And at that time, Sin was maybe 95% white, Jewish, you know. So uh, I got a good education there. Yeah, that was in the, yes, that was in the 60s. So I got a good education there that prepared me for college. I went on to the University of Illinois at Champaign-Urbana. Got degrees in civil engineering. Uh, structural design and construction management and started working for Amoco Oil at the time. Uh, they were uh, probably one of the leaders in the country and in the world in petroleum uh, refining. I was a refinery design engineer. Traveled all over the country for them as a refinery design engineer and uh, left there and started designing components for nuclear power plants. Uh, for Commonwealth Edison, uh, designed steel mills, oil refineries, hydroelectric dams, um, skyscrapers, you know. But that's all my intellect, though. My intellect couldn't save me. You know, uh, I thought that by acquiring intellect, it would make me happy. But the only thing my intellect could do was provide me with a job to supply me with money, to support myself on a physical level. I had, I had a thousand other problems going on in my mind. So, you know, my college education and degrees, it, it couldn't help me solve the riddle of my unhappiness. So I needed another avenue, you know? Thank you. Well, let's see, Charlie paid off. Yeah, Michael, you say that, if I'm correct, your basic assertion is just that the Blacks have a culture that incorporates violence. Yes. I was trying to think what other cultures incorporate violence. The first one that comes to mind is Southern Hillbillies. <laughs> Mountain, they're called Mountain Williams, Charlie. Maybe Indians. Then again, there's cultures like the Yemen who have no violence at all. Uh, are they just embracing the culture of the South? Yeah, the South is a very violent place. Um, it, the people of the South, they have a fortress or a uh, siege mentality. And you get that mentality whenever you try, whenever you try to deny or the humanity of another person or in some way dominate them. You know, you're gonna have, it's, it's necessary that you live in an armed society. 
if you do that. You know, that's why places like the Citadel in South Carolina, I think it's in Charleston, were developed. After uh, one slave revolt, they decided, you know, we need a place to run to if ever the slaves decide to do that again. So, uh, but as far as psychologically speaking, yes, it creates a siege or a fortress mentality within the mind, and it's almost xenophobic, whereas you see outsiders as threatening, and um, you, you have conditioned yourself to, um, to see people as others rather than as human beings. So, yeah, it, it promotes uh, a mentality of violence, for sure. The South was a, the slavery was a very violent institution. We all know that, you know. Carl? Um, you were saying also about this economic, uh, like you said, like, like money doesn't buy happiness? Or, no, not at all. But, but, if you, but the lack of money then also keeps you in jail if you can't make bail? And it keeps you in jail if you can't afford a good attorney. Sure. Sure. Place, so. But it has nothing to do with your happiness. Being in jail has nothing to do with your happiness. John John Bunyan was a falsely imprisoned author who wrote Pilgrim's Progress. I don't know if anybody here has ever read that wonderful book, but it's such a spiritual book that he was able to forgive those who had falsely imprisoned him by going to the higher level, the spiritual level. And he was truly happy, even while being in, falsely imprisoned, because he understood that forgiveness was the first, the first act of anyone who wants to achieve a place in heaven on earth. But, but if you had a, enough money to hire a cop and an attorney, you wouldn't have been able to start. Well, <laughs> Maybe, maybe not. But where, but his, where his, where his physical body was had absolutely nothing to do with his happiness. He understood that on the higher spiritual, spiritual level, and he went on to write that wonderful book, Pilgrim's Progress, while in prison. Uh, David. Yes, you mentioned that you at one point worked for what now is BP Amico. Yes, yeah, now BP Amico, Amico Oil, you know, Standard Oil of Indiana. It did, and some of what. The infrastructure of the Whiting, uh, Indiana refinery. I used to work out there. Is some of that your handiwork? Ah, yeah, yeah. I've got bridges out there that I've built, uh, that I've designed. Bridges that I've designed, uh, piping systems, um, uh, atmospheric tanks, um, pumps. They turn they turn the civil they turn the civil engineer into a mechanical engineer. <laughs> so uh, I designed lots of pumps, compressors. Um, piping systems uh, for the various units, you know, desulfurization unit, uh, naphtha units, uh, all types of units out there. Okay. The Dis question. Distillation units. The other question I wanted to ask is, you speak of blacks of having a violent culture, and of Indians also have a violent culture. Aren't we overgeneralizing just a little bit? I w you know, that's a good question. And, but I would say by the fact that a vast majority of a specific demographic group believes that way, thinks that way, feels that way, acts that way, speaks that way, I don't think it would be an over simplification or over generalization to say that blacks have a culture of violence. I just don't. Um, You're okay, Jack? If, if you could be a fly on the wall, you know, your presence, your presence uh, in the company of a group of blacks would distort their behavior. They may not act that's the way that they would normally act if a white person were not present. But if you could be a fly on the wall and observe their behavior, you would see certain indications that the vast majority feel a certain way about the subject of violence. You know, it's in the language, it's in the music, it's in the 
actions, it's in just about every aspect of their existence. And how do we account for the rise of somebody like Martin Luther King who was dedicated, or Baird Rustin who was dedicated to nonviolence? Well, they had spiritually, spiritually attuned minds. Okay. You know, that, that's why. You know, a rose can still grow in a weed patch. <coughs> what about Black Bar? Oh, Excuse me? There was the violent side of the civil rights. Okay. Yeah, there, right. there were the Black Panthers, the SNCC turned into a violent organization, you know, the uh, Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee. Um, yeah, there were some various uh, groups that advocated uh, violence uh, during that period, yes. Yeah. I mean, you can generalize if blacks have a violent culture. I mean, look at America. It's uh, you know, they start wars in Iraq, Afghanistan. Sure. I mean, uh, the government is violent. Sure. Uh, football, Saturday, uh, Saturday night, whatever, Monday night football. Yeah. Yeah. Is that you know, is that uh, pussy footing around? No, it's violent. Um, people getting concussions all the time. Sure, it's someone else acting out to violence. Those are white people <coughs> running it. So yeah. I mean, but I would say it's, 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 it's entertainment disguise. Yeah, violence yeah. disguised as, as entertainment. Right. Um, there's police brutality. Sure. Uh, some white people. So can you generalize yes. also that white people are violent? All, 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 hum all human beings have a wild and suppressed inner nature. Okay, we all have. We're, we all we're all somewhere between angel and beast. You know, um, human morality teaches us to suppress our tendencies to act out our lower nature. Okay, now if you were never taught human morality, then you wouldn't have that available to you in challenging times, okay? So you don't have um, the same mindset among the different demographic groups. I'll just put it that way politely. <laughs> Asked the question why blacks commit violence uh, against uh, other blacks. Um, don't you have to uh, look at the circumstances and say what cir out outward circumstances lead to, to uh, as well as? Uh, psychological uh, circumstances, uh, and don't you have to check your projections uh, from your own experience and your own feelings? Uh, uh, don't you have to check that with other observers? Well, no. Uh, when you when you're speaking from the level of the truth. The truth doesn't need any outward thing to bear witness to it. So I don't need another individual to yeah, confirm yeah. what I have observed or what I know to be the truth. Now, as far as your first question, where you say, uh, should we take into account the external situations or other circumstances other than the psychological factors of why blacks kill each other? They all rest on that basic premise that is in the paper that says that one black sees and dislikes in another black what he has but cannot see in, in himself. The psychological, if you, if you read the paper, it'll... it'll well, I, you know, I, I didn't read at least some of the paper. Yeah. One black see... Yeah, well... Uh, it's... It could be that, that the, for instance, a family may have several children uh, in a small apartment mm -hmm. uh, or a domicile. It may be run down and so on. And 
and uh, one child has to compete with another for mama's attention, uh, for daddy's attention, uh, or for any attention. <laughs> yeah. uh, they, they, uh, they may have to struggle over uh, who gets what. Um, uh, they may not be all that uh, loving and gentle with each other. Uh, isn't that the kind of thing that uh, promotes violence, some sort of domestic violence at least? Well, only if the child or the children are not properly educated or taught that violence has no useful purpose in any aspect of their lives. If they were taught by a human being who values peaceful resolution of conflicts, but if not, they will be imitative of what they see around them. You have to teach children to live a life without fear, without psychological fear. Uh, yes. yes, Neil? How do you teach a kid to live without fear when every morning they're scared of getting shot on the way to school? Well, or shake them down for for uh, for lunch, for lunch or whatever. That's that's a good question. In the environment that they they live in, but you can teach them to live without fear and to be cautious and aware of their surroundings and their environment. You know, it's possible to you know you don't have to live in fear. You don't have to be fearful. You can you can be conscious of your environment and where you're at without being fearful of I'm it. I'm not eight years old. Okay, okay. You don't have to be fearful of the situation. Just be aware of it. Be, be aware that you're in a place where there's a possibility that someone could shoot a gun. How but, many eight-year-olds have you, have you successfully taught? None. Thank you. Sure. Okay. Yes, Charles? Yeah, Michael, I, at the College of Complexes here, I'm often victimized by unkind statements. <laughs> <laughs> Do you consider those an act of violence? No. In the culture of the college? Ver verbal assaults? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> no, uh, verbal assaults have no power over me. <laughs> Good, I'm safe. <laughs> I'm going to... Well, let's go to Rob. If that ends our question period, uh, we'll proceed to how many. We do get a rebuttal at the end of this. Oh, no problem. So, uh, yes. think about uh, one, two, three, four, five. Uh, about, about seven minutes. Uh, probably at least seven. Uh, we have plenty of time. It's only nine thirty. Take uh, up to five minutes. Uh, we won't be. We might cut you off in that society. Okay. All right. Okay, Frank. And our first butter I only stay because this college of complex is descending deeper and deeper into most outrageous lack of sense and sensical comments. Uh, the speaker today have really beat any other of the ones that I criticize as the worst. He has no idea what he's talking about. He's not connected with anything. He's, he's just totally out of contact with life as it is. When they were asking him about what, what he does with the kid that is threatened all the time, well, you teach him not to be fearful. What kind of a bullshit is that? What kind of nonsense is that? How can you 
to a 10 year old or an 8 year old tell him don't fear going back to school when they are going to beat him up or when he come back home his father beat him up or when his father is beating his wife and he's witnessing that. What, what kind of bullshit is that? We are all, as we are born, a clean slate. And as we go through those first years of experience, our brain is formed. And the contacts that they are made between the different part of the brain are the ones who allow us to survive somehow. And if you are subject to violence when you, as soon as you are born, your connections are to protect yourself from, from that violence, and then you act accordingly to what environment that you grew up. And so you are going to tell them, no fear, don't, don't be fearful, and that will lift your spirit to what? And then uh, some anecdotes or some parables are very helpful to keep you in a higher a spiritual level. What kind of a bullshit is that? I mean, you know, we are going through a very, very difficult time in the world. We are abusing the environment. We are abusing each other. We are, we are really <coughs> destroying the bed that we sleep on. And then to come with these esoteric, nonsensical ideas that you can change the thing by by telling people, don't, don't be, ni be nice, you know, don't be fearful. When the police, every time you, you drive in wild black, then you are subject to abuse by the police every time that you go out, you are telling them, oh, don't be fearful. What kind of, is, what kind of bullshit is that? And then he's telling that he don't want to change anything. So, so what the heck are you talking about then? You don't want to change anything? Well, go home. Why, why do you tell us that you don't want to change anything? I, I really feel it's, it's racism to accuse one, one group of people, like the blacks in this case, to be more violent than, than others were not considered in any of the other circumstances that made the situation as it is. Um, so um, when, when uh, somebody mentioned the United States, the massacres that the United States Army committed against the Native Americans, and then, well, the Native Americans are violent because they killed some people. I mean, how do you... Uh, separate one of the other, why not take it to, 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 to all in total uh, consideration, all the events that, that lead to certain circumstances, certain events. Um, so anyway, uh, we are brutal, humans are brutal, but uh, the, the way that I think we change things and we need to aim to that is to educate, educate, and educate. And educate in the, in the scientific way to see things. If parents are educated not to, not to produce violence against their kids, if you can produce a little bit of a change, if the kids go to school and the teachers treat them well, feed them when they are hungry, then you will have results. But, but to, oh, well, I don't want to teach anything. I don't want to learn. I don't want to change anybody. So then what, what the heck are you doing? It's just, it's really, I didn't leave before because I wanted to have the opportunity to say something. Because I wanted to go. Uh, thank the speaker for having enough guts to face a group like this. Uh, and I've only been able to do that in rebuttal. I have never presented here. So he's got, he's got some guts, that's for sure. Uh, but if you want to get a contemporary uh, idea of the things he was talking about from a different perspective, uh, read The New Jim Crow by Michelle Alexander. Uh, I think that would be at least a good start. Uh, in Jane Adams Senior Caucus, we worked on uh, 
racism issues. i give you one example. Externally, we looked at the Alden nursing home chain. I've known a couple of people that have been in the no, uh, uh, nursing home chain. It's got about 31 uh, nursing homes in uh, Chicago and surrounding area. Three of, three of the people I know were white, and they all went to one on the north side, and they all got pretty good care. However, on the south side, we found out through the Community Renewal Society that they don't take very good care of the people on the south side. Isn't that funny? They found uh, one guy fell out the window, the fourth floor window, to his death, and somebody on the street had to find this person not the uh, people in the nursing home itself. We're also at Jane Adams, we're looking internally at our own uh, racism and uh, what we can do to uh, make our, uh, our, our uh, organization uh, more uh, compatible to all of the people in Chicago so that someday we reflect the whole of Chicago. Uh, and I want to tell a story that I told before. This is out of uh, uh, Doris Kearns Goodwin's book, uh, uh, Team Arrivals. William Seward, who was the Secretary of State, uh, before he was Secretary of State in about 1830 or so, he went with his wife, his kid, and a, a free black man to the South. They were going, uh, they found out once they crossed the Mason-Dixon line, I guess, everything changed. Here's one thing they saw. They saw a white guy who had ten little black boys, ages six to ten, all uh, tied together. And when these kids uh, got to a certain point, the uh, guy who had a whip in his hand, let the kids drink at the horse trough. Then the kids laid down and cried themselves to sleep. Now, is there anything good about that? Wouldn't that make you angry to even know that? So, um, I guess the speaker has a different point of view. I don't understand uh, engineers, to tell you the truth. Thank you. I do thank our speaker for coming tonight and putting the role of Daniel in the lion's den. Having said that, however, I am troubled by his, what I consider his sweeping and overbroad generalizations of all blacks, all Indians, some of whom were very quiet, peaceful people, and some of whom were not. And that wasn't only true with the intrusion of the, of the U.S. Army, some of them like the Apaches and the, and the um, so on. The Comanches were in fact fierce warriors regardless of who they were fighting against. And some were quiet, as I say, and, and very peaceful people, or at least they would be if they had just been left alone. Secondly, our speaker tonight used the analogy of a cat. And he used the analogy, he said that a cat doesn't have any natural desire to be a lion or tiger. Obviously, you have never owned a cat. I have. My buddy Felix was playful, friendly, and affectionate with me. He was not friendly to anybody else. And furthermore, most such cats hide when somebody comes over. Felix did not. My father used to call him the field marshal. Because Felix aggressively confronted anybody who came over to my house. He either growled, snarled, hissed or spat at him, or sometimes he tried to attack it, ha attack him. And I would have to tell him, Felix, stop that. And he would give me this look as if to say, I'm just trying to do my job and defend the territory. <laughs> or as my own therapist who studied some zoology as well as psychology put it, you had a regular little miniature tiger there. No kidding. My furry friend sometimes couldn't decide whether he was a domestic cat, a lion, tiger, jaguar, leopard, bobcat, mountain lion, palace's cat, etc. So, I would say your statement about cats is not accurate. Thank you.
Right. Yeah. Margaret Aguilar. Okay. Um, thank you again, and I'm going to thank you, like everybody else. Thanks you for coming into the lion's den, as it were, and trying to uh, beard the lion in his den. Um, I really um, found. I have to be very critical of what you said um, because I, I didn't find your argument convincing or organized. Um, you, you contradicted yourself several times. And um, I felt it, essentially that I was sort of li listening to a Republican speak. And so, you know, it's just like you're, bl you're blaming the victim. Um, you don't uh, give any kind, you don't have any kind of statistics to back up what you're talking about in terms of causes. You have effects, you have lots of statistics about effects, but nothing about causes. In fact, when you look at crime, the victim and the perpetrator tend to be of the same race anyway. So a lot of this is, is undoubtedly due to the fact that our neighborhoods here are, are extraordinarily segregated, Chicago being one of the more uh, most segregated cities in this country, so that you know you 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 rob and you uh, assault and you murder people who you're close to, <laughs> and oftentimes know very well, but certainly people within your neighborhoods and your communities. So you tend to have white on white. If you look at when white people are assaulted, it tends to be with a white perpetrator as well as the black on black crime or Asian on Asian, or Hispanic on Hispanic, or, we, or American Indian on American Indian, so that it, it, that it's black on black is not anything that's terribly distinctive. What is distinctive is the amount of, of uh, crime that you're talking about. And that certainly can be accounted for the history of this country as a genocidal, racist um, country. We were founded on the genocide of the, of the American Indians, um, we massacred Indians as, as if we could. We started out on the eastern coast with the um, with the, the ideas of manifest destiny and that God gave us this wonderful ground and well there's Indians there, well you know it's ours, that's it. You know we'll buy it from them when obviously uh, people from this hunter-gatherer society had no, had no really did not have a concept of private property. So we went in and we bought off some chiefs and paid off Manhattan with some beads and, and blankets and stuff, and then and then said that we owned it. And then we backed it up with a um, with the technology of, uh, of guns and, uh, and whatever. And then just really, uh, when we um, came to this country, probably there were from five to 10 million, you know, it's really difficult to get um, appropriate census figures, but by the, 1930s, there were 500,000 American Indians in this country. So we decimated reducing the population by 90% is literally what we did to American Indian people. The majority of that was diseases that we brought over from Europe, typhoid and, and cholera and smallpox particularly. We wiped out entire ethnic groups, um, Indian ethnic groups with uh, smallpox. So the other thing that you did not take into account was the, um, the fact that this kind of oppression not only, uh, well, several things, but you know, this oppression that starts out with denying women appropriate like prenatal care tea, and appropriate uh, nutrition when the when, uh, fetus is developing, in Thank fact, you. if it's severe enough, retards brain growth. So you have kids who are born and their brains are smaller and they're just not, they're mentally retarded because of the fact that their mothers didn't get appropriate nutrition and didn't get appropriate prenatal care. And that's really documented um, in, in all kinds of literature and in all kinds of circumstances, not just in African Americans, but in, in wars and poverty and all that. Um, and then after a kid is born, their brain structure is affected, and this is something that's relatively new uh, research information, by uh, their brain structure is changed by experiences that they have. And probably we all are, but that's, prob that's the basis of post-traumatic stress disorder, 
But when you're looking at, a, at the developing brain of a child, and it really physically develops until puberty, that you're looking at that development and the effects of things that happen to children are much more profound than the things that happen to adults. You don't have as much deal with, uh, as much reserves to deal with it. You do, um, you don't have you don't have the experience to deal with the kinds of, of uh, things that that happen to you as you do as an adult. And if you have these kinds of really severe experiences when you're a kid, your friends are murdered, your 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 mother gets beat up. Um, you know, women who've been raped, you know, all of the, are in, or, or even grabbed and raped in front of you, I mean, who knows? But those kinds of experiences that are more common in oppressed communities, no matter what color they are, is really has really profound um, effects on, on the brain development of anybody. And so we have a culture um, of, of violence in this country against, um, against poor people, period, but also, but because, but against people of color. And we can just, there's all kinds of documentation of that. And people that deny that, and really deny that without really looking at it, are, I don't know whether people are feeling like they're benefiting from that, or they need to maintain that fiction, that, um, that the people who are violent are, are, are somehow, uh, it, that it's somehow something within themselves that they're totally responsible for and that the structure and institutionalization of racism in this country does not have any effect on that and to deny that uh, that um, that it does I you know where is the you know where are you making the money off of this I really want to know so um, Slavery has really been analyzed as a very peculiar institution in this country because it does take very specific forms um, that were not any place else in the world. Generally, in the world, you were a slave, and then you could buy your way out of slavery, um, or, or your children were not slaves, born as slaves. Um, that it was not perpetuated as an institution, which it was in this country, very differently than it was many other places. Slaves in this country did not have any civil rights at all. In Rome, like, you know, you couldn't, you couldn't really mistreat, you could mistreat your slave kind of, but the slave had rights. The slave had rights to money that they made on the side. The slave had a right to marry, and the slave had a right to, that their children could be free. And th these rights were not in, in chattel slavery in this country as it was practiced for 300 years. Um, the, this racism was so endemic that, it, you know, you could have one drop of black blood and you were African American. Actually, one of the really funny, ironic things was this guy who's a white racist who wants to establish a town, and I think it's up in Michigan, North Dakota, thank you. See, he knows some stuff. Um, uh, it found out that he was 14% black. <laughs> He's excluding himself from the city. It's really wonderful. Um, okay, so um, you know, I think it, actually we can look at some uh, research that we, we learned about earlier today. Um, and um, are, are listening to the to uh, WBEZ that. Uh, about the, they were talking about getting away from it, and in, in Oklahoma, of all places, they have state-supported preschools for anybody who wants to go to preschool. And so what happens is, and so this means four-year-olds is preschool, okay? So they have uh, uh, they have preschool and they have kindergarten, and and there's about a 75 percent rate of kids who go to preschool and kindergarten. And so when they compared the two groups of children, the ones that went to preschool and the ones that didn't go to preschool, particularly if, and specifically if they were from low-income backgrounds, they found that the kids that didn't have preschool were not ready for school, did not have math readiness, did not have language readiness, did not have um, social readiness, any social skills, didn't, or had very few social skills, didn't have reading readiness, all of these things that it takes 
to get settled into kindergarten, for God's sake, when you're five years old, and, um, and, and make a success of school. And when they looked at these kids later on, and there's a number of studies about this, that kids that were in good preschools, and, and, and Head Start has some fairly high standards in terms of teachers and curriculum and research-based um, effects, that the kids who have been in Head Start, who have been in decent preschools, uh, later on, lower crime rates, they tend to go further on in schools, they tend to they, uh, establish stable families more uh, at a higher rate. There were all kinds of percentages of better kinds of social skills and all kinds of, uh, all kinds of measures about how they were more successful in society. And the whole point is, is that the fact that they were, they were, by the preschool, they were ready to get into the school and benefit from all the school programs, that that made a profound effect on their lives. And this didn't have anything to do with race, but it had a whole lot to do with the fact that the legislators who passed this law had to sneak it past all these Republicans who didn't want to spend anything, and red or the yellow dog Democrats down in Oklahoma they didn't want to spend anything, but they snuck it into the law. And um, when we go to other states where the state legislatures do not view educational money spent on education as an investment in the future of of of, this, of their city or of their state that they look at it as an expense that they have to cut and they have to increase the number of kids in classrooms, decrease the number of teachers, decrease the number of special kinds of education that goes on. You know, the, those are the people that are selling us down the river. And it doesn't have anything to do with race. It has a whole lot to do with greed and short-sightedness and, and not understanding and not knowing what the hell they're doing. And so a lot of what happened to the, what you talked about today had a lot to do with that. And I really think that people need to wake up and, and hold their legislators feet to the fire. And I'm going on beyond my five minutes, but I'm on a roll, guys. But at any rate, you know, it, we have to hold our legislators' feet to the fire. We have to get decent health care and decent housing and decent education for people. Otherwise, we're just going down the creek. Yeah, well, I'm not going to say anything about what's been going on here tonight because there was more important fishes to fry, as it were, earlier this week. And I stuck around for, because you know, as long as Frank and Margaret stuck around, I wanted to get my wraps in, as it were, ASAP. Because what we did was went to a Nuclear Regulatory Commission hearing. And there were only going to be, there are only going to be 15 or some such around the whole country. Pertinent to the issue of nuclear waste, and specifically in this case, a court ruling ordering the NRC to go back to the drawing board and redo their... I guess one might have to say wet noodle approach um, to, uh, to the issue of nuclear waste. And what they did in response to this court ruling was to come up with a position paper, as it were, which, at least according to a lot of the folks, there was also pretty much a wet noodle approach without anywhere near the sufficient amount of detail. So, well, it was, you might say, something of a microcosm of American political culture. Yeah. Uh, the, certainly by my lights, the most memorable comments of the evening, and to, to, to back up here, everybody who wanted to comment could get three minutes of comment. Um, I ended up missing my three minutes, which was just fine, and I'll get into that in a bit. But, this woman made the point, hey, you tell you what, folks, this hearing is a farce, and they could have publicized it, but they didn't. There was, as she understood it anyway, free media available that the NRC folks didn't use. 
And what you had, folks, was a room of maybe 200 chairs, give or take, right? And roughly half of them were full and roughly half of them weren't. And damn near half of them were filled with industry folks. Now, it was a fairly even split or something close to it anyway. Well, you know, you can look in the daily paper, etc., every day, and you can find out when the bulls and the hawks and the bears are playing. But not enough Chicago area folk knew enough about this. You know, they, they fill up stadiums, you know, you get 20,000 folks for a, for a game at the U United Center, right? And here you got maybe 100 folks. And these things, they're not every night or twice a, or, you know, twice a week or anything like that, like with the sports events. No, this was going to be once in a what? How often do they have these sorts of things in the Chicago area here? Once every five years or something? Well, yeah. And, you know, uh, yeah, okay, I, you know, I guess nobody was going around wearing flashy uniforms with a big C on them. But still, considering the stakes, it was, I'm tempted to say, brutal that so few folks were informed of it such that so few folks went. When, arguably at least, um, one way or the other, their fate was at stake. Well, as it happened, the thing started at 7, it was scheduled to end at 10. And, but it turned out that they let it go on for another hour, roughly. And, you know, when you walked in, you could sign on the sheet, and, as I did, and uh, I didn't realize that guaranteed that my name would be called. But that was well after 10. And uh, not long after 10, Frank was out in the hall talking to a dude, and eventually it occurred to me, gee, I should go and sniff this out. Well, it turned out this dude was a technician, I guess you'd say, as, who was part of the <coughs> NRC staff. And so there we were talking to the dude for a good hour-ish, um, to getting into all sorts of technical type of things. And Frank was grilling him, you might say. Uh, you know, trying to, and the guy was reasonably forthcoming in his way. But as a result, okay, it turned out, unbeknownst to me, yes, it turned out that they were calling everybody's name, so I later <laughs> learned. Uh, so it turns out I missed my three minutes, which is maybe just as well, because who knows what I would have said that would have been as a worse choice. It's one thing for me to pretty much let it all hang out in front of this camera here. It's another thing to do so when the camera is controlled by Big Bro, and it's going to go on a website of Big Bro. So, uh, yeah, I was ambivalent about that whole sort of thing anyhow. So it's just as well that we stuck with it and uh, got to, as it were, grill this tech type out in the hall there, and he gave us his card and we can email him and, you know, I wish I could remember half of the things we talked about um, that he, he implied he would you know, be willing to address in email form. So, what can I tell you? I, what I would have, surely one of the things I would have said had I bothered to use the three minutes would have been, well folks, you know, there's the, the famous Bismarck quip about how you don't want to see how they make sausages and you don't want to see how they make laws. <laughs> And Shramik's corollary is, well, pretty much you don't really want to see how they enforce it either. And so, uh, and of course here we're dealing with enforcement by the NRC of laws and regs. And uh, let's just say that when the public is asleep because the media doesn't tell them about shit like events like this, one can hardly blame the brass of the nuke outfits for licking their chaps and realizing that they've got 
in all likelihood, a free ride. And so they're going to have a blast while the party lasts. But alas, we're in the golden age now, but the prognosis is not so good because the media is as asleep as it is. Okay. Again, uh, I have to agree with and thank you for Frank and Margaret and others have pointed out it takes a lot of uh, a lot of courage and confidence to come here to this group and face people that have a wide range of knowledge and experience in several fields. So sometimes uh, you know we try to add things that are constructive, and that's what I'm going to try to do. I think there's a couple of questions that haven't been asked. Am I correct in assuming that you went to high school after a year, moved to a school on the north side, and then graduated, went to college, and then when you got out of college, was that in the 60s? I graduated in 1974. You graduated in 1974 and then went to work for Amico. Amico. So I made a short list. Uh, Amico Oil, uh, BP, uh, ComEd, uh, those are if you worked in those, you were employed by those people, you were working for companies that were owned and operated by billionaire Republican predators, some of the biggest polluters on the planet. And my question is, you know, do you think, and you came through high school and college and, um, and got a job at the very end of the golden age of the middle class with middle class was thriving from 1945 to 73 in this country. So if you come out of college, get a good paying job, do you think it has any effect or any, uh, will that affect your viewpoint 30, 35 years later uh, looking at people uh, that are less fortunate than the people that got jobs in the golden age of the middle age when middle class jobs were paying a living wage in America. Things are totally different. You know, um, I just wonder how many people would share the view that it's um, that we have. We can tell young black people that they, they shouldn't be afraid when young black people are living in a country where, in many cases, it's a crime to be walking down the street engaged in the activity known as breathing wild black. Forget about driving wild black. They're stopping and frisking in a lot of places. Uh, the black community has been solidly under attack since 1973. Uh, for, the billionaires got together in 73 as the middle class was growing and that's been pointed out in a lot of books like Censored News 2014, Tom Hartman's book The Crash of 2016 is brand new. It has a whole history of the evolution of the 80-year cycles, where at the end of the fourth cycle, every 80 years, the billionaire predators run wild and rob everything in sight and get rid of as many human rights, you know, rights that people have built up. They try to destroy the middle class and push everybody back to a question of uh, status of almost slave labor. That's that's what's going on in America today, and it's obvious, you know, to many many different commentators. Uh, you didn't mention, as I said, the, the black community, the African American community in America has been under solid attack since 1980. Economically, here's a book that was written called The Dream Foreclosed. In the last, uh, since about the last 10, 12 years, the black community has been targeted by mortgage companies that use bounty hunters. A bounty hunter for a mortgage company is a uh, mortgage broker that can seek out uh, black families and you get a bounty if you can pull them into rewriting their mortgage into a subprime mortgage with higher interest rates and balloon payments so that the bank can reclaim the property after when the balloons kick in and they can no longer make the payments. So economically the black community is under heavy attack. For those of you that have you read this book, incidentally, The New Jim Crow? I'm familiar with it, but I haven't read it. Anybody that hasn't read this book, I highly, highly recommend it. It describes the concept of what I call the new supervised public housing. 
the old public housing was kind of a failure and the, and the, the billionaire owners and landowners weren't making a lot of money off of it so they said let's basically defund all the public housing in America and make a new generation of supervised public housing. It'll have bars on the doors and windows. So all the money that used to go into public housing like the projects and everything, that's all been defunded for poor people. You, you have a, a better chance of getting into Harvard than you do getting into decent, affordable, subsidized housing in this country. But we're pouring money into the prison industrial complex. The for-profit private industrial prison system is one of the most economically profitable things on the planet. It's spelled out in the new Jim Crow. And the reason for this is, one, they're making huge profits. Say it's forty to $50,000 per person to keep a, a person. You could send a man to Harvard or Yale for the cost that it keeps him in a private prison, right? But the other thing is, they don't care about the time. It's not the crime or anything, it's the label. In America, we develop laws. It's, it's illegal just to walk up to somebody and say, well, you're black, I won't uh, you know, sell this car to you or anything, or I won't rent, or uh, we won't do this or that. That became illegal, so they thought, well, let's develop a way to label black people as felons. If you have a felony on your record, they can discriminate you against you until the cows come home. That's what this book is all about. It describes the massive uh, years, decades of discrimination that hasn't gone away in America. We have a whole bunch of old white racists in this country that uh, are doing their damnedest to eliminate the middle class and the black middle class. And uh, Charles, uh, for those of you that haven't seen it yet, I highly recommend getting a copy of this thing. It's called Predator Nation. It describes how the billionaire predators are owning and operating uh, our media, our government. Uh, there are several studies that have been produced showing that the best, if you're a billionaire with a few hundred million laying around, the best return rate of return on your money you can achieve is investing in a senator or a congressman or a federal judge. So uh, it's a trifecta. Tom Hart, the uh, last thing I'll, I'll say, where's that other book? The African American community, the drug war, the prison industrial complex, and the drug war both uh, came up at about the same time. Dr. Nancy Turner Banks wrote a book called AIDS, Opium, Diamonds, and Empire. And this is about, most of it is about the 150 year drug running history of American corporations and the money laundering of the banks and everything else. And in, in, the, in the late 80s, uh, the African American communities in major cities started to experience a, a huge influx of crack cocaine and with also a huge influx of appointing racist judges to federal courts. So they put judges in place to pick up people that came into court with a, a few you know, a half an ounce or something or a few grams of crack cocaine and the judges would give them a five or ten year sentence. So they started filling the new supervised public housing with people that were picked off the street with something that would have got a 30 day warning if a white person had done it. So uh, if you want to know the history, the, the, the subtitle of this book is called The Deadly Virus of International Greed. This isn't just about uh, the AIDS epidemic, and incidentally, in this book, she describes how the tests developed, the blood tests for AIDS, are front-loaded with chemicals, certain chemicals that are known to react 500% more likely to African-American blood than Caucasian blood in healthy people. So the African-American community has been targeted with the AIDS test from day one, along with uh, 300,000 gay people that were targeted with those bogus tests. So uh, these things aren't widely known because they're blacked out by the mainstream press. If you, what, if uh, if you if you live long enough, you know you'll see in Chicago almost everybody knows someone who died during the AIDS epidemic. A lot of people died, but a lot of people didn't have to die if they had gotten proper treatment. That's a, uh, we've never had, as long as I've been coming here, we've never had a one-hour presentation on the alternative treatments that have saved millions of lives all over the world. That's a subject that's blacked out in America. But other countries all over the planet, they're working with people, uh, helping them live longer, 
Uh, if you're HIV positive, they say you can live a long, healthy life if you get proper treatment and proper medicine. So that's for a whole other time. But the thing we need to know is, I don't think you can tell young people, uh, just change your mindset and don't be afraid, when if your skin is black, there's all kinds of predators, economic, police, uh, you know, you name it. Uh, you know, it. It's a tough thing growing up as a black person in America today. And if we're going to solve these problems, like he said, uh, everybody recognizes that white and black babies, they're not born to be gangbangers when they come out of the mother's womb. It's a question of how you're raised and the conditions you grow up in. So we have to work together to change these conditions across the spectrum. Does that make any sense to anybody? Yeah. I hope so. Thank you. Yes, that makes some sense. Uh, and uh, but the question of how we deal with the uh, the mindset of bus is another question. Uh, when it's the projection of uh, violence that you've known in your own family or in your own neighborhood, how do you deal with it? Well, you have to have some sort of a model. You have to see somebody else dealing with it. And you have to have some idea of how you're going to get support in your dealing with violence and uh, with the, your own violence. Uh, and that's what we can do for one another. We uh, can deal with our violence, and uh, there is a certain value in uh, trying to understand why somebody else is violent. Uh, that's what, uh, what people do, and with more or less success. Uh, there are some things that make for success in dealing with uh, uh, violence in others. Uh, some people are good teachers. They can understand why a kid is acting out. Uh, there are some people who are... Uh, I remember uh, Rose... Uh, oh, what was her name? Ah, she was a school principal in Brooklyn. And uh, uh, she was Jewish and she was uh, a blonde. And a Jewish blonde was not always popular with other Jewish girls. Uh, but but uh, she she was a, a socialist and a pacifist, uh, and she came from Russia when she was a little girl, and she became uh, uh, she became a school teacher and, uh, and then a principal. Uh, well, Rose, what? And she would spend hours after school. Uh, guiding <laughs> bad boys and bad girls uh, in their ABCs it's and very, uh, learning how to read yeah, and write. It's very typical. That's what, uh, when I'm from Russia, that's what teachers did. They, without money, without Yeah, well, money, it wasn't just, true just in Russia or the United States. It's true everywhere. People, somebody has to care. When, when you express your caring for other people, they are encouraged to care about themselves and to maybe examine what you think uh, of them and what their behavior. Uh, they, that that uh, may not be uh, anything uh, very deep psychology or anything, but we 
it, it takes time to deal with problems yes. and with people with problems. Right. Uh, it, it's uh, it takes time and attention, and you have to give of yourself if you care. Uh, whether you're sitting under a banyan tree waiting for wise people to come to you to learn something as uh, Gautama Buddha did, uh, or you're uh, going to people uh, with their problems, uh, uh, both health problems and monetary problems and family disputes and uh, low opinions of themselves and of, uh, of each other, uh, as Jesus did. Uh, they, these, uh, we can learn from their examples, and we can learn uh, from both of their positive uh, experiences and their, their failures. I, not everybody Jesus spoke to uh, what a way to say, Thank you, sir. you know. Yeah, that's for sure. Yes, sir. That's a second Jesus time. Yeah. Uh, well, at any rate, uh, I want to thank the speaker for uh, the giving of himself. Uh, he was asked uh, to come because uh, he has devoted some time and attention and. Uh, try to uh, put into coherent uh, thinking uh, a, a somewhat, well, I, I think it's somewhat mixed up <laughs> philosophy myself of, of what, uh, how, how you deal uh, with uh, violence and, and apparently he's yes. more concerned with uh, People's inner. Oh, we're having a leak here. A little attention by the restaurant to the cold that uh, this end of a restaurant gets, uh, and the two leaks uh, might help uh, the experience. Of, all right. Well. I don't know. But that's very materialistic, and I ask you to. Uh, Jesus and the last time. To overlook some of that materialism, uh, and uh, we will hear from uh, Mr. Peterson about uh, uh, his reactions to our reactions. In reaction to what our speaker said tonight, what he's simply saying is that culture and the way you people are raised matters. He may be right about the black culture in this country having a lot of crime and, and the way it goes. But I've also known too that in, in, with earlier ethnic groups that before they really became assimilated into the American culture, a lot of other of these similar things were said. Less than a hundred years ago, they were saying the same thing about the Irish and the Italians and the Catholics and everything else. So this is not something that's new. I've only considered that our black culture has only been able to fully assimilate in the last 50 to 60 years after the passage of the Civil Rights Act because they were put down for so long. And I can tell you from personal experience that I know a lot of black people who decry, quote, black culture and they become, quote, white, meaning that they become successful in their own lives through, through a lot of their efforts of education, a job, and other ideals. I specifically remember when I was back in college in their early 80s, a discussion that we had in a speech class about the black culture and the white culture and how certain blacks sold out their black culture and how certain blacks were too white for other blacks and I said and I'm looking at them and I'm saying am I a racist 
They're telling me I'm a racist when this very same group is condemning their very own kind. With that kind of, uh, at least with that class and that time, I found snobbery, I found divisiveness, I found competition, I did not find inclusiveness, I did not find many of the things that are in there. And our author may be right about some of that quote unquote gang mentality being brought in. But I can also tell you at the same time through my involvement in the Toastmasters group that I have seen many black people succeed, that I have seen many who are personal friends of mine, I've looked to as mentors for how to do things a lot better. And as far as I'm considered, Martin Luther King was right. It's not by the color of your skin, but the content of your character. And I'm also saying today that as money is, the way many of you decry our present American culture, at the same time, this culture is producing innovative products, uh, leading the world in a lot of different ways. And I'm still convinced that if America loses its stature in the world, we're going to see a much worse world. We are the first country in the world to, inter to fully integrate a, demo a democratic institution. We're also the country that tends to make up its ways over time. We did, this country was founded on slavery. We got rid of slavery. We finally lived up to our own creed with the passage of the 1960 Civil Rights Act that all men are created equal. And, you know, even now with what you say is labor exploitation and everything else and globalization, it may be time for a new New Deal. But I have a feeling that we're going to be the ones to pass it first. It is, after all, Roosevelt who came up with the original New Deal and Europe that followed in his example after World War II, after we implemented some of the things. Now, granted, it was Britain at the time that we came in to do that, but a lot of the good things that the world has has emanated from our country. A lot of the good things that this world sees, freedom, free elections, peaceful transition of power, and yes, a culture of entrepreneurism, innovation, and economic opportunity, despite skin color and privilege and all this other stuff, is still, I believe, alive and well. And I do believe that there is a way that this culture can be taken care of. Tomorrow morning, I'll be headed to an, an institution that many of you decry, but I think still holds a lot of hope for the, the country, and that is the Christian church. I have known several people who have had their lives bettered once they start really getting into that philosophy. Now, I'm not going to sit here and condemn any other religions because I also know Jewish people who've gotten their faith a little bit more in and learned how to be civil with each other. I've known several Muslims of the same persuasion that once they got a little bit more involved and became self-aware of what their troubles were and found a way to meditate and, and learn about their various institutions, were able to better their own lives. I have seen firsthand families that were in very desperate circumstances, and the very church that I attend attended to them, helped them out, get them back on track. So I'll be, I'll be darned if I'm going to sit here tonight and see and hear that the cynicism of this country is going to blankety-blank in a handbasket because there's still a lot of bastion of hope. And Jeff, as far as your Nuclear Regulatory Commission and your waste are concerned, to me the issue's closed. Just get thorium molten salt reactors on and burn up the waste. End of story. Thanks a lot. All right. Let's thank our speaker again. He put a lot of time and effort into this. I know you wrote things up. Thank you. All right, I'm going to be eclectic as usual here. Um, uh, perhaps not entirely Christian in my comments. But that's oh, fine. You, yeah. got you have a right to speak. Oh, I'm going to get home and get, I can get to church. It ain't going to happen.
I feel sorry for people that get trapped in Christian families, you know. But um, to me, it's a very liberating experience, Charlie. Good, good initial shot here. He, he, he put some time and effort in here. He was here last week, trying to figure out what to say and do. Uh, tough topic here. Uh, what he's really talking about is culture, and. I actually at one time was going to pursue a career in anthropology, which is the primary focus of that subject. And I didn't do so because I felt a great many of the cultures had disappeared, or at least what I determined to be the interesting ones, but after the World War II, 1950, with the homogenization of culture in the world, and they weren't quite the, the same in isolated situations here. Uh, the other thing, I mean, culture is a complex, I didn't, I'm trying to search my mind. It involves everyone's role in the society, sort of uh, rites of passage, uh, the hierarchy, uh, the power structure, things of that nature. So it's complex, and they come in and say, well, you know, is there violent aspects inherent in a culture? That's perfectly valid to say. Um, the other thing about culture, a few years ago, this thing was kicking around the multiculturalism, that they were not subject to objective analysis, or that was, was not appropriate, or in essence unfair, and I can't concur with that. Cultures certainly can be judged in their features that they have. You can analyze them and the common features from one to another here. Uh, some of the things, you've got to be cautious too. Um, make an assessment of Muslim cultures are unfair to women. However, if you discuss those who are in the culture, uh, they feel that there's nothing wrong with modesty. And that's how they define it. And they say, well, there's modesty in all cultures. So it's not necessarily all that easy to do at times. I've heard some things here about the Indians. There are basically about 500 sure. cultures of the Native Americans. And you also if you have to look at the Native Americans before the settlers came here. And there, in fact, were very, very violent tribes yes. among those 500. And there were very specific ones. When you guys get done, let me know. Uh, as a matter of fact, one of the interesting things are the Delaware Indians, who actually were quite, people kept to themselves and wandered around, they actually from the west to the east to find a peaceful place to live. One of the other things is I think the settlers in the United States had the misfortune of encountering what were perhaps the most militaristic tribes of all those 500. And they seem to have made the news. Uh, they, in fact, even wiped out other tribes without anything, any white intervention. There was internecine warfare. Uh, other things about a comparison of tribes, Lewis and Clark actually encountered the tribes. They had nothing wrong to say about them. They said they were really pretty cool people, except for one tribe uh, whom they just said these were the worst miscreants and they wanted to have absolutely nothing to do with them and just beat it out of there. They were just stealing their stuff and just not, not even conducting themselves in any way. But anyhow, if you look at the thing, um, uh, let's see what else I was going to say here. Uh, you know, getting into cultures, one of the things that I've often hear though, and Jeff isn't here though, is like the, actually one that's kind of interesting is like the culture of Germany and the culture of the Nazis, you know, which came first? Or was there an interaction there or something like that? Or did they change the culture? Or were they inherently one way or another? You could go through that. That's just kind of an interesting thing here. 
But anyhow, yeah, um, I mean, it, I, it's been a few years since I've studied it, as I said, but it is a valid subject matter. It is a comparison, how they interact and how they change over time. Uh, how there's a simulation or mixtures between different cultures is certainly going on. It's going on right now. And it's kind of things, if you see change within our own society, you have to look upon it as cultural change here. Uh, materialism is creeping in and things of that nature. I was looking at the thing, there was some disputes about how one celebrates holidays, which is actually a cultural aspect. There's some dispute about whether it's appropriate to go shopping on Thanksgiving. It seems to be an issue uh, of late whether or not you should be celebrating it with your family. Uh, and some people thought it was totally appropriate to celebrate Thanksgiving at uh, a holiday at a mall, where in other cultures it wouldn't be the same. Now let's do a little briefly here about hearings. Jeff was talking about that, and he was blaming the media because of the attendance. Whatever. I happen to go to a lot of hearings, and the state of Illinois building things like that. It's not the responsibility of the media to have people knowledgeable about public hearings on issues. It's the responsibility of the stakeholders. And yes, about half the time you're going to have some people from the industry, and the other time you're going to have, if you want, people from the community or for special interest groups. And it's their responsibility to get their people there and to provide testimony. Now, I can tell you for a fact, I was involved in public transportation. I had some issue on the, on the public hearing regarding transportation last week. I mildly notified the state of Illinois of my concerns, and at the actual hearing itself, I was approached personally by the chief of the transit system that apologizing and trying to say that they were not responsible for the thing. We've tried to change our way our hearings are structured, things like that. But it's not really not the responsibility of the media. If you want the media there, you notify them and tell them in advance and have your structure there and things like that. They, that's your job. Like I, there's public hearings coming up and one of the things that I do regularly is start mailing lists is notify them of the dates, time, and locations and things like that. So that's really why it's good to be in an organization and have a good, healthy organization that keeps it out uh, and disseminates it. We're, we, we've been battering them for years on public transit hearings that the information be given in advance, the schedule of speakers. We can go any time during the year. We change the, the arrangements so that we're not struck into one thing. Any month, at least, we can go in and make public opinion voice. And we structured that. So do like we did. We changed the thing that, and I have done that. I have gone to the regional transportation. I was there in July, and I had an issue out of them. And then we may be going back. So you have to structure and structure your environment that you have. That's all about culture. Is, I just say, I don't know, I, I have a Lithuanian culture, but uh, we don't have, we don't have any, we're kind of like nothing of culture. <laughs> we haven't accomplished anything ever. We don't really have. bother anybody. We don't even bother each other. The first web-based <laughs> government in the world. <laughs> <laughs> but anyhow, thanks a lot, sir. I enjoyed it coming in when you got another one, didn't you? Thank you. Speaker gets the last word. Yeah, um, I don't want to take up a lot, a lot of time here. I just wanted to say I didn't come here to change anybody's mind, and I did not come here to disparage any group of people. The only thing I wanted to do was to get the facts out and allow everyone to process them as their conditioned minds will. Um, I, uh, I have no 
um, regrets about coming here, and I appreciate everybody's comments. And uh, I hope to um, come back to some meetings in the future because I do enjoy this free willing format. Okay. Yeah. And uh, I, I, I thank everybody okay. here for coming tonight. Since you are being taped and uh, this will go out to the web, how would somebody get a hold of you if they have further questions? Well, they could contact me by my email, which is at the end of the uh, literature that I brought here. Uh, it's don't, my name. Okay, don't give your phone number, but just no. the, the email address? Yeah, my email address is my name with zz at the end at yahoo.com. That's Michael Peterson, zz at yahoo.com. M I C H A E L P E T E R S O N Z Z as in zebra zebra at yahoo.com. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, everybody, for coming and uh, giving your attention to the subject and to each other. Thank you.